Let's read the Bible and poetry. The poetry of Luke. To begin his biography of Jesus, Luke chooses to include three poems in the first two chapters, the Canticles of Mary, of Zechariah, and of Simeon respond through poetry to the great turning point of history in order to tell of the marvelous, the life, death, and resurrection of the Son of God. Luke seems to find it natural to make recourse in the first instant to poetic writing. He also describes what is at stake in this sudden eruption of the extraordinary as well as the reaction of those who are its actors and witnesses in a prose that is eminently poetic in how it suggests through quotations and repetitions a new reality that it does not make explicit. This prose first of all evokes the impossible at the threshold of the story, Elizabeth appears, the future mother of John, the Baptist. However, she is barren, like Rachel, who nevertheless bore Joseph, or the wife of Manoah, who bore Samson, or Hannah, who bore Samuel. And she is too old, like Sarah, who gave birth against all expectations to Isaac, the son of promise, and the pledge of the salvation of Israel in the church. Luke remembers above all Sarah without mentioning her. Just as he does not mention Rachel, Hannah, or the wife of Manoah. When the angel Gabriel announces to Zechariah, the husband of Elizabeth, that they will have a son, Zechariah replies, I am an old man and my wife is in advance in age. Luke returns to the Greek of the Septuagint. Where Genesis states Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in age. Alone among the evangelists to speak of Elizabeth, he introduces his story through an unsatisfied woman and through a divine in intervention that opens the future by triumphing over the unrealizable. Elizabeth brings together in her flesh all the barren mothers of the Old Testament. She will bear the last of the old prophets. The precursor of Jesus, from the conception of John the Baptist, Luke passes on to the Annunciation in the course of which Mary, a virgin, learns that she too, although she has not known a man, will become pregnant. While Matthew, in this miraculous fertilization, shows the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, Luke compares it to that of the sterile Hannah by giving birth to Samuel and by delivering a beautiful canticle of joy that Mary herself will take up. Hannah represents the woman whose prayer is answered. Luke's dense and evoca evocative narration vibrates with the expectation of something else, of an in intervention from elsewhere, echoing the end of Psalm 113, which states as a particularly powerful reason to praise God, he gives the barren woman a home, mother, joyful in her children, or echoing this prophecy of Isaiah, concerning the city of Jerusalem and the new Jerusalem. Raise a glad cry, you barren one who did not bear. Break forth in jubilant song, cry aloud, you who have not been in labor. Isaiah 54, 1. Luke begins the story of Jesus with two women who cannot have a child and through implicit allusions to miraculous mothers of the Old Testament in order to suggest that a new era has begun. The frustration of the fallen world will come to an end. A new birth is announced. A new world is born. The words of the angel Gabriel to Mary, nothing is impossible for God. Which first of all, clarify the incarnation, the humanly inconceivable presence of God in human flesh, resonate through the whole gospel and the good news of the remission of sins and the access to eternal life. Gabriel also quotes the Old Testament, God having said to Abraham in front of Sarah's incredulity, Is anything impossible for the Lord? The Hebrew word means too difficult, but also extraordinary. Wonderful, the Jerusalem Bible translate, is anything too wonderful for Yahweh. Our world with its rational material borders that are apparently so fixed asks only to welcome the impossible wonder. Abraham, too old, becomes the father of countless descendants. And Mary, the virgin, gives birth to the Son of God. 
Neither Isaac, nor Joseph, nor Samuel, nor Samson, nor John the Baptist, nor Jesus is born of the will of the flesh. Their births evoke that of the Christian, which is impossible to realize on one's own as the mysterious language of Jesus shows in the conversation in John. Unless one is born anew or from on high, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus is matter of fact, but very human reply. How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother womb and be born? This is the message of the New Testament. We can be born anew in the whole universe with us on the condition that we recognize in advance that within the limits of our possible, such a new birth is impossible. That and that in front of this incredible promise, we are powerless. Luke's prose, elusive and repetitive, also describes the reactions to this sudden intrusion of the astounding. It creates a very well-defined atmosphere through an effect of accumulation without Luke having need to specify. Immediately after having referred to Elizabeth's barrenness, he has the extraordinary enter in an angel appears to her. Husband in the temple, Zechariah, is troubled and seized with fear. Phobos. And listening to the angel's greeting, Mary is troubled at seeing an angel in the glory of the Lord that surrounds them. The shepherds are struck with great fear. Each time the angel responds, do not be afraid. Me phoba, me phobias. But the emotion that shakes them so is not. Only terror at a supernatural being suddenly become invisible. It seems to include real dread. A response appropriate to the invasion of the world by the divine. In saying, do not be afraid to Zechariah, to Mary, and to the shepherds, the angel separates natural fear, which because they are not threatened, they have no reason to feel from religious fear, which they rightly feel in front of the alterity of God and his messengers. The same distinction is found in Exodus at the moment of the Ten Commandments when the people are terrified by the voice of God. Moses answered the people, do not be afraid for God has come only to test you and to put fear of him upon you. So do not sin. Purely human fear must give way to fear of divine and solitary, solitary origin capable of mastering sin. Fear undergoes a kind of purification. Phobos undergoes a carthesis. The fear of inherent to the fallen world is transformed before the presence of he who judges it and saves it. Luke explores this fear throughout his gospel. It takes hold of Zechariah of Elizabeth's neighbors and of all the inhabitants of the hill country of Judea. When John the Baptist is born, of crowds who see the miracles of Jesus and of the disciples at the transfiguration, and at the appearance of the risen Jesus. This fear is accompanied by wonder. The relatives and neighbors of Zechariah marveled. Ethau Messan, writes Luke, when he announced that the newborn would be named John. All who heard shepherds wondered. Ethau Mason, at the birth of a savior, Joseph and Mary marveled. And Thelma Zatas, Upon hearing what Simeon prophesied about Jesus, Jesus himself, who knows how to be amazed. For example, by the exemplary faith of a centurion, elicits wonder at the marvelous become incarnate, alterity suddenly present. The first to listen to him wondered as soon as he began to teach. Reading a passage from Isaiah on the Messiah, wonder seizes the disciples when he tames the storm and the crowd when he heals a mute person. Peter is in wonder before the empty tomb and likewise all the disciples in front of his risen body. Thank you for listening. God bless you and I love you.